Number one, Drew Hendry. Yeah. Yeah. Question number one, Mr Deputy Speaker. Prime Minister. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As I said last week, the condolences of the whole House are with the family and friends of Michael Martin. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Drew Hendry. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Many Highland businesses rely on EU national employees simply to operate. Yep. Given that her Government already makes a charge of up to £1,000 per year per person for non-EU nationals. Will she categorically rule out any such immigration skills charge for EU nationals after the UK leaves the EU? Yeah. We, we recognise that uh, after the United Kingdom leaves the European Union, there will be still be those from the EU who wish to come and work and study here in the UK. There will still be UK citizens who wish to work and study in the European Union. And we will bring forward our proposals for those arrangements in due course. Maria Caulfield. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Does the Prime Minister think that it was the Labour Party voting against 69,000 uh, first-time buyers uh, with the abol abolition of stamp duty, or the Labour Party voting against 50,000 extra school children getting free school meal, that convinced local voters in the election last year? retain control of Westminster and Wandsworth Council, and it's why they gain control in places like Redditch, Basildon and Barnet. Yeah. Can, well, order, order, order. Can, can I just say, it's not the Prime Minister's responsibility for the Labour Party, but I'm sure she'll be able to get an answer for the Prime Minister. Well, uh, thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I can say to my honourable friend that she is right about votes that took place in this House, where the Labour Party did vote, the opposition did vote, against the uh, abolition of stamp duty for those young first-time buyers, which is proving so helpful. But last Thursday, last Thursday, what we saw, when millions of people across England went to the polls to vote for their local councils, was that the real winners were ordinary people, because more people are now able to get the benefit of Conservative councils councillors who keep their council tax low and provide good local services. Jeremy Corbyn, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. First of all, Mr Deputy Speaker, could I put on record my thanks to Mr Speaker for attending the funeral of the late Michael Martin on behalf of this House this morning in Glasgow. Uh, does the Prime Minister agree with her Foreign Secretary that the plan for a customs partnership set out in her Lancaster House speech is, in fact, crazy. <laughs> can, I say to, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, we are leaving the European Union, we are leaving, we are leaving the customs union, but of course, for our future trade arrangements, uh, a trade relationship with the European Union, we will need to agree customs arrangements, which will ensure that we leave the customs union, that we can have an independent free trade policy, that we can maintain no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and that we have as frictionless trade with the European Union as possible. And I'll tell, I'll tell the right honourable gentleman what's crazy. What's crazy is a leader of the opposition who for years opposed TTIP and now has a policy that would mean Labour signing up to TPIP with no say in it whatsoever. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, could the Prime Minister explain why uh, she and her Cabinet spent wasted weeks working up proposals that the EU said was unworkable, yeah. the Foreign Secretary described as crazy, and does she agree with her business secretary, who apparently backs the crazy customs partnership proposal, but made it clear he doesn't back a technological alternative when he told the BBC that jobs would be at risk if we don't sort out a comprehensive customs deal? <laughs> what, uh, what the business secretary said, what the business secretary said on Sunday was that it was absolutely right that we should be leaving the customs union. And if the right honourable gentleman wants to talk about jobs, I'm happy to talk about jobs. Half a million, half a million jobs lost under the last Labour government, record employment rate under this Conservative government. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr 
Speaker, the government says it has two options. The Foreign Secretary says one is crazy. Sir Ivan Rogers, our former EU ambassador, said the, that the technological alternative is a fantasy island unicorn model. They have two options, neither of which are workable. The case for a new customs union with the European Union is clear, to support jobs and living standards. Why is the Prime Minister ignoring all the major business organisations, all the major trade unions, in backing a customs union? Isn't it time she stood up to those described last night by the father of the House as these wild right-wing people? (laughs) Prime Minister! We are leaving the customs union. What we are doing is ensuring that we deliver customs arrangements that leave the customs union, that ensure no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, as frictionless trade with the EU as possible, and an independent trade policy. But what would Labour give us? They want to go into a customs union with the European Union, with no say over trade policy, with Brussels negotiating trade deals in their interest not our own. The Labour manifesto said they wanted to strike trade deals. Now they've gone back on that policy. Typical Labour letting Britain down once again. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, she presides over a divided Cabinet. She's had 23 months. She has had... Twenty-three months in order to negotiate a, an agreement and hasn't made any progress on it. The CBI says a comprehensive customs union after transition is a practical real-world answer. The TUC, on behalf of six million workers in this country, put it simply, ruling out a customs union risks jobs. The government continues to reject a new customs union, but at the weekend the business secretary made clear that neither of their options would be ready to to be implemented by December 2020. So can the Prime Minister tell us what is her preferred option and on what date it will be ready to be implemented? Minister. Well, the right honourable gentleman takes about, uh, talks about uh, the length of time in the negotiations. Of course, it wasn't until March and the uh, agreement to move on to the next stage of uh, deals of uh, uh, negotiations that it was possible to have discussions with the European Commission on the customs arrangements. Uh, there are two options. There are two options that were in my Mansion House speech. Uh, questions have been raised about both of those options, and further work continues. But I just say, if I may say this to the right honourable gentleman, he. He has spent an entire career opposing a customs union. Now, when the British people want to come out, he wants to stay in. I know he's leader of the opposition, but that's going a bit far. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr. Speaker, due to divisions within the government, these negotiations are in a shambles. And this House is being denied the opportunity to debate crucial legislation affecting the future of our economy and communities all over Britain. So can the Prime Minister now tell the House when we will debate the Trade Bill and when we will debate the Customs Bill? She's had 23 months in order to get ready for it. Minister. The Right Honourable Gentleman talks about the state of the negotiations before the Right Honourable Gentleman talked about the state of the negotiations. Before December, he was saying that the negotiations weren't get get, going to get anywhere. What did we get? A joint report agreed by the European Council. He said before March we wouldn't get what we wanted in the negotiations. What did we get? An implementation and an agreement with the European Union Council. We're now in negotiation for the best deal for the UK when we leave the EU, and we will get the best deal for the Euro- UK when we leave the European Union. Prime Minister. Three months we'd had a better answer than that from the Prime Minister. Mr Mr. Deputy Speaker, how can they negotiate in the future interests of people's jobs and living standards when Cabinet members are more interested in putting their own futures first? Fundamentally, Fundamentally, Mr Deputy Speaker, how can This government negotiates a good deal for Britain to defend people's jobs and living standards when they are unable to reach an agreement within themselves. Prime Minister. 
I'll sell this uh, the right honourable gentleman what this government has been doing to defend jobs. A balanced approach to the economy opposed by the Labour Party. Changes in legislation to work more workers' rights often opposed by the Labour Party. We have been ensuring that we see the jobs being created in this country. Employment rate at its highest rate uh, in, since records began. What we are seeing in relation to the unemployment rate is at its lowest uh, rate for 40 years or more. This is a government that is putting jobs first at every stage of what we are doing. And last week, last week, what we saw up and down this country, whether in Barnet or Dudley or Peterborough, was the British people voting to reject the Back to the Future economic policy of the Labour Party and the broken promises of Labour. They don't trust Labour and they don't trust their leader. Jeremy Quinn. Thank you, sir. Under this government, the introduction of a total cost cap on payday lending has more than halved the number of people with problem payday loans that are unmanageable. Would my right honourable friend agree that now is the moment for the FCA to push this out and to extend that same successful policy to uh, impact and confront doorstep lending? Prime Minister. Can I say to my honourable friend, and I know he has been uh, campaigning hard for the issues, on the issues of financial inclusion, and that's very important, and he's working hard to promote that. And we do are committed to ensuring that consumers uh, are protected from unfair lending, uh, lending practices. I understand the FCA is currently conducting a review of the high-cost credit market, including doorstep lending, and will be publishing an update later this month. And of course, we've given the FCA new powers to cap the cost of credit, and they'll do so if they believe it's necessary to protect consumers. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We all woke up this morning to a much more dangerous world. Donald Trump has undermined progress towards normalisation of relationships with Iran. Can the Prime Minister tell us, in her representations to the President on Saturday, did she speak in the strongest terms on the lunacy of the actions that the President of the United States is taking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. I have been very clear in a number of conversations with the President of the United States about the belief of the United Kingdom uh, that the JCPOA, the nuclear deal with Iran, should stay. That is also the view that is shared by Chancellor Merkel of Germany and President Macron of France. And the joint, that was made clear in the joint statement that I issued last night with Chancellor Merkel and with President Macron. We accept that there are other issues in relation to the behaviour of Iran that need to be dealt with. Ballistic missiles, uh, the question of what would happen at the sunset clause at the end of the nuclear deal, and the destabilising activity of Iran in the region. Uh, Those are issues that need to be addressed, and we are working with our European and other allies to do just that. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister, of course, did not make any reference to sending her Foreign Secretary to appear on Fox News as part of his foreign policy initiative. Pleading with the President through Fox News rather than through direct intervention. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Middle East is in need of stability. Conflicts are already raging in Yemen, Syria and Iraq. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary can't deliver a foreign message abroad in the correct manner. Whilst at home, the Foreign Secretary undermines the Prime Minister on the Customs Union. Prime Minister, can you tell us when the Foreign Secretary will both agree with her own government's position, and if not, will she have the backbone to send them to the back benches? Prime Minister. Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that it is absolutely right that Government, in uh, addressing the issue of the Iran nuclear deal with the United States Government, worked across all levels uh, and made representations at a variety of levels and in a variety of ways. That is what the Foreign Secretary was doing in Washington. It is what he has done with his opposite number in the past, as I have done with President Trump, as has happened with our French and German colleagues as well. We continue to believe that the Iran nuclear deal was an important step forward in helping to keep the, uh, keep the world safe. And as I say, there are other issues that need to be worked on, and both I and the Foreign Secretary will be continuing to work on those with our European and other allies. Julian Stead. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, over the bank holiday weekend, spectators turned out in record breaking numbers to watch the Tour de Yorkshire. <laughs> Enjoying the county's finest hospitality with images of the UK's most beautiful countryside beamed to millions around the world. 
Does the Prime Minister agree that major sporting events like the Tour de Yorkshire provide significant economic benefits and investment in our regions? And will she join me in God's own county for next year's event? Prime Minister. What can I say to my honourable friend? It was indeed, it was indeed very good to see millions of people uh, on the roads of Yorkshire cheering on the Tour de Yorkshire uh, as, it took, as it took place this bank holiday weekend. As he says, these events are not only hugely enjoyable for sports fans, uh, but they also bring huge economic benefit to the area. And they show off the best of Britain in the world. And that's why I'm delighted uh, that uh, next year we'll also see Cycling Road World Championships taking place in Yorkshire next September, bringing the world's best cyclists uh, to Yorkshire, and we're providing financial support for these championships, and I'm always happy to visit Yorkshire. Yeah, yeah. Deirdre Brock. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, 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 yeah. My constituent was born in Kirkcaldy to parents who have the right to stay in the UK indefinitely. His entire life has been in Scotland, his schooling, university, and now his professional work as a structural engineer, but he can't get a British passport. He tells me he fears the knock on the door that so many Windrush people heard. Can the Prime Minister assure my constituent and the many people like him, whose cases are analogous to the Windrush people, that they will get the same consideration and be assisted in obtaining citizenship with the fees waived? Yeah. Prime Minister. The, uh, the, the former Home Secretary was absolutely clear about the offer that is being made to those people who were covered by the legislation, the 1971 Act, uh, who came here to the United Kingdom uh, before 1973. Uh, I'm sure that the Home Secretary will, in, will ensure that the case that the Honourable Lady has raised is looked into carefully. Uh, often uh, cases are raised in this House, and there is a complexity sometimes to cases uh, that needs to be looked into very carefully, but I'm sure the Home Secretary will ensure that that case is properly considered. Leo Dockett. My constituency of Aldershot is the home of the British Army and has a very fine yeah, 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 yeah. tradition of military service. And I'm delighted that today, Mr Deputy Speaker, the commander of the Aldershot garrison, uh, Colonel Mac McGregor and his wife Deborah, join us in the gallery yeah, above. Yeah, 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 yeah. Next month, Colonel Matt will leave the army after nearly 40 years' service. So, could the Prime Minister join with me in thanking Colonel Matt for his service mm. and the tremendous good works he does in the wider community of the Rushmore Borough? Yes. Yes. Prime Minister. Well, can I, can I say to my honourable friend, I'm very happy not only to uh, welcome uh, the Colonel and his uh, and his wife to the gallery to watch our proceedings today, uh, but also to thank him for the significant service that he has shown our country in his time in our armed forces and all the work that he has done as commander of the garrison. Uh, at Aldershot, and we wish him all the very best in his retirement from the army. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The life sciences Scotland firm Techno Pharma Services employ 50 people in my Livingston constituency. They test the safety standards of everyday drugs to ensure our citizens are kept safe. In their trade bill evidence, they expressed grave concerns about the lack of information and plans for Brexit. I met them last week, and it's fair to say their concerns have gone from amber to red. Life sciences in Scotland and across the UK are reliant on a harmonised regulatory environment. Patient safety is on the line and businesses need answers from the Prime Minister. When will they get them? Yes. Prime Minister. I say to the Honourable Lady that, as I made clear in my Mansion House speech, uh, the European Medicines Agency is one of those that we wish to discuss with the European Union the possibility of us having an association, associate membership of. Uh, I and the Business Secretary and others spend time with the life uh, sciences industry and with other industries, understanding their concerns, and we will be looking to ensure that we can provide the same level of, uh, of uh, interaction in the future that in enables our life sciences industry not just to continue at the current level, but actually to be enhanced and to grow in the future. Dr. Caroline Jones. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating the Bomber County Gateway Trust on approval of their plans for a full-size Lancaster bomber sculpture in the? And in this, the centenary year of the RAF, does she agree this will be a fitting tribute to the service personnel, both past, present and future? Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I say to my honourable friend, I'm very happy to join her in congratulating those who are looking for an appropriate commemoration in relation to the Lancaster uh, bombing squad, to uh, recognise all that was done by those who were involved uh, with the Lancasters. But this, as she says, is the 100th. Uh, year, the anniversary year of the creation of the Royal Air Force, and we should all across this House uh, show our gratitude and support for all those in the Royal Air Force who have contributed so bravely to the safety of our country over the years. Matt Weston. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, cretinous, crazy and certain other words, beginning with CR, 
are used by used by some members used by some members on the benches opposite have been used to describe the Prime Minister's proposals for a customs partnership. However, credible is not one. Can the Prime Minister please explain how she sees this, given that so many businesses, particularly those in the automotive industry and the likes of the CBI and the Chambers of, of, of Commerce, are so against this and prefer to see the continuation of a customs union affording truly frictionless free trade. Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As I said earlier, there are two options for delivering on the objectives that we have set. We will leave the customs union. We want to ensure no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Uh, we want to ensure as frictionless trade as possible between the UK and the EU. And we want to ensure that we can have an independent trade policy. What I have to say uh, is not credible to the Honourable Gentleman is a Labour Party policy that wants us to be in a customs union and giving all the power for negotiating our trade deals to Brussels with no say in it from the UK whatsoever. David Everett. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Would my right honourable friend welcome the re-election of Bex's Conservative Council? Congratulate them on their good record locally and look forward to their continuing to implement efficient and effective Conservative policies. Prime Minister. Well, can I say to, uh, can I say to my right honourable friend that I am very, very pleased to welcome the re-election of Bexley's Conservative Council. I was pleased to speak to the leader of Bexley Council shortly before the elections last week, uh, and I am very pleased that the residents of Bexley will now be able to enjoy yet more years with a good Conservative Council delivering great local services at lower cost. Matthew Pedicure. Mr Deputy Speaker, despite the ever-present threat of death from both Syrian and Russian airstrikes, and in the face of smears and disinformation, the rescue workers of the White Helmets have never stopped saving the lives of their fellow Syrians. Last week, the Trump administration froze their US funding. With thousands of civilian lives at risk, will the Prime Minister step up, pledge the government to plug the funding shortfall that now exists, and ensure these heroic rescue workers can continue their work. Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, we recognise the very important and valuable work that the White Helmets are doing. They are, as he says, doing this in horrendously difficult conditions. They are incredibly brave to be continuing that work. We do support them. We will continue to support them. And my right honourable friend, the International Development Secretary, will be looking at the level of that support in the future. Rachel McLean. Thank you, Mr Deputy yeah. Speaker. Yeah. to join me in congratulating the four fantastic new Conservative councillors. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who have been elected to Redditch Borough Council, taking the control of the council from the Labour Party to the Conservative Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. happy to join her in congratulating those newly elected Conservative councillors. I, I had a list of councils earlier where people had rejected Labour, like Barnet and Dudley and Peterborough. I can add, I can add Redditch to that list and indeed other councils around the, uh, around the country. Many congratulations to her, to those councillors and all the volunteers and activists who work so hard. Jeff Smith. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In, in the last year, the Trussell Trust has given out over 3,000 food parcels to my constituents in South Manchester, half of them to families with children. The Trust say that the government's flawed rollout of universal credit has, flawed, has, has fuelled the 13 per cent rise in food bank use over the last year. How does the Prime Minister explain that rise? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Obviously, the Honourable Gentleman knows that we don't want to see anybody uh, having to use food banks. What we... What we have done, what we, did in relation, what we did in relation to universal credit, as we are rolling it out, is listen to concerns that have raised, and we have changed the arrangements for universal credit as a result. Robert Court. 
Congestion on the A40 in West Oxfordshire is a blight for residents. Uh, with developments, including the Cotswold Garden Village, set to increase demand, will the Prime Minister work with me to ensure that upgrades to the A40, to buses and to the Cotswold Railway Line ensure that we have an integrated transport structure to keep West Oxfordshire moving? Yeah. Can I say to I'm my, my hon. Friend that this is an important issue that he's raising on behalf of his constituents, and I recognise he's absolutely right to do so and how important it is to them. Of course, at the Budget we did announce a money, £1.7 billion for the Transforming Cities Fund, delivering transport infrastructure for the future, but we also ensured that local authorities are able to bid in to uh, over £1 billion of discounted lending to support high-value infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, that's about us actually giving power back to local people, recognising the importance of infrastructure uh, of the sort that he has recognised. He's raised some specific issues, though, and I know that my right honourable friend, the Transport Secretary, would be happy to discuss them with him. Yeah. When the Prime Minister told the nation she was on the side of the hard-working family struggling to make ends meet, did she have in mind a Britain divided across the generations, as described in this week's report by the Resolution Foundation? Prime Minister. The, the question of intergenerational fairness is one that we recognise and that is one that I think the whole of society needs to recognise. What we need to do is ensure that we are helping young people get their foot on the housing ladder, help to buy and buying more homes, abolishing stamp duty for, first time, uh, for those many first-time buyers. What is important is that we make sure that we have jobs for people in this country, that our young people are skilled and educated to train to take on the jobs of the future. That's what our modern industrial strategy is doing. That's the best thing we can do. Ensure, as we are doing, that we have the policies through our balanced approach to the economy that provides the jobs and homes for those young people for the future. Yeah. Luke Graham. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yesterday, the Scottish Affairs Committee heard from RBS executives, given this publicly funded bank's blatant disregard for the local communities it serves, would my right honourable friend join me and strengthen the access to banking standard to give local people more of a say when banks remove vital local services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They start to see. What can I say to my honourable friend? I think it is important that we have put those access to banking standards in place and that there are alternative uh, arrangements in place that we have encouraged uh, people to be able to, uh, to take up to ensure that they are able to access the banking facilities that they need. Holly Lynch. Post has this weekend taken the unprecedented step of calling on the Secretary of State for Transport to resign, accusing him of repeatedly betraying our region over rail. Yeah. Yeah. Electrification yeah. is nowhere to be seen, trains are routinely overcrowded and delayed, yeah. and wheelchair users are left stranded when access lifts are broken or locked, all set against record ticket prices. Can the Prime Minister explain to passengers in Yorkshire when they will see a rail service which is truly capable of delivering the Northern Powerhouse? Yeah. Prime Minister. We are putting record investment into rail across this country, and that includes investment in rail in the north. And transport, we are supporting transport for the north, which is coming forward with proposals for the north. This is a government that recognises not just the importance of infrastructure, but the importance of infrastructure across the whole of this country. Andrew Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Yesterday, along with our honourable friend for Romford, we launched a One Britain, One Nation All Party Parliamentary Group, which will be working with schools to promote pride in our country, respect, tolerance, and inclusion, regardless of one's background. Will the Prime Minister join me in paying um, the tribute to the founder of Obon, Kash Singh, for the hard work he's doing to promote unity within our communities and our schools? Prime Minister. Well, can I say to my honourable friend, I think it is absolutely right that we pay tribute to uh, those like Cash Singh who are working to promote inclusion, to promote unity in our communities. And it is important uh, that we do see that those, me- uh, those uh, values of respect and inclusion, regardless of one's background, are ones that everybody recognises and practises. Um, we have changed the law so schools have to actively promote our fundamental British values of democracy, the rule of law, of individual liberty and mutual respect and tolerance for those with different faiths and belief. Because 
I am very absolutely clear that nobody's, nobody's uh, path through life should be affected by their background or where they came from. It should be how far they go, should be how hard they work and their talents and not their background. A successful start-up forced into bankruptcy by government delays in paying out European regional development funds. A tech company's expansion plan stalled because government won't guarantee it access to the native European language speakers it needs. These are businesses I've spoken to in Newcastle in the last two weeks. So in the absence of any guidance from government on businesses preparing for Brexit, will the Prime Minister agree that Tory infighting is costing us jobs in Newcastle? No, can I say to the Honourable Lady, she's raised a number of points. We've been clear about the support we're giving in terms of the uh, funds that have previously come from the European Union. We've also been clear about the issue of citizens' rights for those people who are here in the uh, United Kingdom from the European Union currently, and for those who will come here during the implementation period up to the end of December 2020. If she wants to be worried about policies that will affect jobs in Newcastle and the North East, I'll tell her the policies that would affect jobs in Newcastle and the North East. That's the policies of her front bench and her party. Dr. Julian Lewis. Does my, does my right honourable friend recall that the previous Secretary of State for Northern Ireland suggested that the possibility of dealing with legacy cases by a statute of limitations coupled with a truth recovery process would be included as an option in the forthcoming <laughs> consultation exercise? Does she accept that that is a legitimate option? option for consideration, and will she ensure that, therefore, it is not excluded from that consultation exercise? Well, can I say to Prime my Minister. honourable friend that this is a very important issue that he raises. At its heart is the support and gratitude that we owe all those who have served in our armed forces. Yeah. Our armed forces personnel are willing to put their lives on the line for our safety day in and day out, as are personnel who work in law enforcement. And the peace we see today in Northern Ireland is very much due to the work of our armed forces and law enforcement in Northern Ireland. But we have uh, an unfair situation at the moment. The situation we have at the moment is that the only people being investigated for things that happened uh, in the part of these uh, issues that happened in the past are those in our armed forces or those who served in law enforcement in Northern Ireland. That is patently unfair. Terrorists are not being investigated. Terrorists should be investigated, and that is what the government wants to see. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Waiting times for PIP tribunals in Wales have quadrupled over the past four years. My constituent, Alan McKittrick, is suffering with prostate cancer, angina, diabetes, COPD, arthritis, hernias, mental ill health, dizziness, blackout and ulcers. Yet his initial PIP claim was refused. He then waited 56 weeks for an appeal, which he won. Will the P Prime Minister apologise apologize to Alan, and when will she end this hostile environment towards uh -huh. sick and disabled people? Yeah. Prime Minister. To the, to the honourable gentleman, obviously, uh, members across this House raise issues about the PIP process, and the Department of Work and Pensions is consistently looking at the whole of the PIP process. But one of the issues that he raised in his question was the health of the individual concerned. Now, as he sits for a Welsh constituency, I would have thought if he wants to talk about health, he should talk to the Labour government in Wales. Yeah. Order. Thank, you, through. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I recently visited a construction site for 85 affordable homes in Cotmoney, my constituency, which is benefiting from a £3 million Homes, uh, um, in homes England grant. Will my honourable friend assure me and assure the House that she will continue to work with the new Housing Secretary to ensure that more people, like those in Cotmoney, in my constituency, will, uh, will fulfil their dreams of home ownership? Mr. Can I say to my honourable friend, I am very happy to give that commitment to her. I think it is very important, and as I, as I uh, mentioned in response to uh, a question earlier about the intergenerational issues, there are young people today who worry they will never be able to get a home. This government 
government is committed to building more homes, but also to ensuring that we help young people to get their foot on the housing ladder. That's about what we've done in stamp duty, abolishing stamp duty for so many first-time buyers. It's about ensuring that we have put more money into help to buy. Helping young people to get their foot on the housing ladder is a commitment of this government, and we will continue to do so in her constituency and elsewhere. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The government has made a decent start at tackling the problem of our overuse of plastics, but we know that if we are going to get recycling rates up to where they need to be, then we are going to have to look at the production processes, a point that was made to me by pupils at Anderson High School in Lerwick on Monday. Will the government work with the plastic manufacturers to see what they can do to reduce the 50 different types of plastic that are currently in use and in that way make it easier to sort and to recycle them. Minister. The, the, the right honourable gentleman makes a very important point. We are uh, making some progress on plastic, but we do need to work with the manufacturers to, uh, about the production of plastic in the, uh, in the future. And that is why we are doing exactly that. And the business secretary and the environment secretary and others are talking to manufacturers about how we can ensure that plastic that is produced is plastic that will be recyclable uh, and is uh, not going to be plastic that just ends up in our oceans with all the problems that that causes. Alex Chaw. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Afghan interpreters who served alongside British troops did so with skill and courage. Can my right honourable friend confirm that those who have made their homes in our country will be able to remain and that the ordinary fees will be waived as a small sign of our gratitude? Prime Minister. Can I say to my honourable friend that he raises an important point about Afghan interpreters who did serve, as he says, bravely alongside our armed forces? Uh, and I know that this is an issue that the Home Secretary has been looking at particularly in relation to the, uh, the fees for those particular individuals. It is important. We, some, some people have been able to and wish to return back to Afghanistan and have been given opportunities by the government to retrain and to uh, help to establish their lives here, there. But it is important that we recognise the Debt that we owe them. Millennial. Um, crime in North East Lincolnshire is up more than 20%. Recently, we've had a single punch death, a serious blade attack, and an incident involving 200 hooligans that forced Grimsby families to flee our local seaside resort of Cleethorpes. Humberside Police have 310 fewer frontline officers, 550 fewer support officers than they had in 2010. Will she accept that her cuts mean that residents in Grimsby and Cleethorpes no longer have the fully funded and properly staffed police force that they deserve? Prime Minister. Since 2015, we have been protecting police funding. We have made available... This year, this year we have made available £460 million uh, pounds extra to uh, policing across the country. That is more than the Labour Party was committed to in its election manifesto last year. And, uh, and as I have always said, and indeed as the Shadow Policing Minister has said, there is no direct link between the number of police officers and the issue and crime and the, num- and, uh, the funding. 